sure. Uh, yes, we have a space, but yeah. Uh, yeah, just pop it over there if someone. Okay. <laughs> the staff to give me a big applause. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming, the people that have arrived. I appreciate it very much. And for anyone watching on webcast, I'd just like to say, hi, Mum. But anyway, so what we're going to do today is, first of all, a little background on me. I'm the writer of this book, The Weekend Artist, which came out about three years ago. And basically what we'll be doing, and it's a series of um, 24 acrylic projects. Uh, they're basically quite easy. And I'll go into why I did it and how I did it and some of the ins and outs of publishing, because there's a couple of people in the audience who are interested in publishing their own, or possibly publishing their own book, so we'll be talking about that. And then we'll also be doing a couple of projects as well, just in case other people find that quite boring, and I actually find it easier to talk while I'm actually doing something as well, so it's for my benefit too. Uh, so we'll be doing two projects today. We'll be doing this one, which I'll have to just adjust that for the camera, because the camera sees down here as well. And we'll be doing this one, which probably won't show up too well on camera, but it's actually black with a lot of gel on it, a lot of black gel on it. No, we won't be doing that one. That's a bit too complex. So you'll have to maybe watch that one and just see how that progresses. So how did I come to write a book? Like most people say, I have a book in me, or you know, they have a book in them, and how do you write one? Well, basically, I never intended to write a book ever. I never had any ideas about writing one. I had no aspirations to write one. But I started working in an art store after I was fired from an IT job that I hated, and I decided to go and study graphic design. So in order to study graphic design, I needed a part-time job, so I started working at an art store in East Sydney. And what people would do is they'd come in every weekend and they'd sort of bring in you know, a crumpled up picture from a magazine or a newspaper, and they'd want to actually do a project. And, or they'd sketch things up themselves. Anyway, there were so many awful things that they wanted to do that I thought, you know, there must be better projects out there. So I started watching some television shows and I used to think, gee, these projects are awful. I wouldn't want them on my wall. You know, like, they're good to experiment with, but I think as an adult, you do actually want something that will look relatively good. You know, it's all very well to see seashells on things and it's a, it's a nice process, but do you really want to put that on your wall other than your children's wall? So I wanted to come up with some projects that I felt were simple and easy and could be done in a weekend. So we came up with the name The Weekend Artist. It was originally called Confessions of an Art Store Assistant, but <laughs> it's a bit racy. But um, <laughs> the, they changed it, uh, the publisher changed it because Confessions on a Dance Floor from Madonna came out and they didn't want to think we were ripping that off, which of course we weren't. Um, so basically, so anyway, I started to put together a range of little projects that people could do. You know, just for myself, I'd have a little sketch. I'd say, oh, you could do this and you could do that. And instead of doing this, why don't you do this? And I started to basically compile them. And before I know it, I thought, there's a book in this. I really think there is. So if anyone's thinking of doing a book, basically you've got to come up with an idea, of, of course, but an idea that hasn't really been done before or an angle to an idea that hasn't been done before. With the proliferation of blogs, that's not always easy, but there's always a new idea and there's always a new way to do it. And, you know, if it's not you, then why, you know, why not you? That's what I always think. Like, someone's got to come up with new ideas, so why not you? And so you've got to come up with a good angle. And when you approach a pub, the best way to do it is to look at other books. Like, if say you're doing a knitting book, you go around to all the bookstores and you look at all the books that are for knitting. And you look at the publishers and you'll start to see names of publishers coming up. It's not so good to do this on Amazon or online because there's a lot of American publishers. And American publishers, as a as a whole, aren't too responsive to people from other countries. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but you normally have to have a bit of a profile before it does. 
So you'd look around, and for me it was Murdoch books. That kept coming up. Like everyone kept saying, oh, Murdoch books. I'd look and it would all be Murdoch books. So I rang them and I said, you know, I've got an idea for a book. What do I need to do? And they said, well, you'll need to do a proposal. And they have a very, very detailed request for what you have to put into a proposal. Like, it's, it's not just, you know, two pages on my thoughts. It's you have to put, do, from memory, it's more than this, but it was four chapters to completion, a full index, remaining chapters all spelt out in paragraphs, photographs of all projects, what you thought was different about your book, where you thought the market was for your book. It was quite in-depth. I always thought people just, you know, rolled in and said, I've got an idea, and they went, that's great, let's do it. But they don't. They actually almost make you write the book before they consider it, which is a really good idea because when you do it, it does change, but the map of the book is almost in place by the time you've done it. So because I'd done graphic design, I was able... This is actually my original proposal, and it looks very similar to the actual book, like the way it's set out. Because I was a graphic designer, I could come up with some reasonable concepts that they were happy with. Um, but it's also, I think, a good idea to not present this amazingly complete idea because often they'll want to have their input in it too. They'll want to say, well, you know, we think we could modify it by doing this or we think we could modify it by doing that or, you know, like, how could we go about doing this and how could we go about doing that better? So there's a, definitely a two-way street with the publisher and you have to be willing to basically compromise some of your ideas and they have to be willing to compromise on some of yours as well. And there's always a point, and I got an email <laughs> saying I was getting a bit too pushy at some stage while I was doing my book. So there's always a point where, you know, you're... You know, it's just compromise all round, and it's quite an intense process doing a book as well. So I'll start doing the project. Now, the first project we're going to do today is, as I said, the tree blossoms. And I've already started doing some of it because we obviously have a limited amount of time. And we'll start doing these. So basically... This was the first project in the book that I did and it's simply done with a potato. It's like, because I wanted something that wasn't too intimidating for people and I felt like a potato print isn't going to intimidate too many people. But I've already coated the back. Now, that's a mixture of uh, Matisse carbon black and white and that I've blended to grey and this is just the Matisse carbon black. And what I'm going to do is just put on a few more branches here. I'm going to open it so people can see. And I use that as a guide for what... I would do as well. Now, all these projects are just basically acrylic paint. And I'm using the Derivan, which is just a student quality paint. If you're starting out, you don't have to use the best paints you can get initially. You'll eventually, if you continue painting, what'll happen is you'll start to get, you'll start to see why you want to use a better paint. You'll start to see that, you know, perhaps the colour isn't quite as, you know, strong as you'd like or you'll see colours in sort of high ranges of paint. But starting off with student stuff is fine. And, you know, you can use a palette, but for the purpose of this, I just used to use takeaway container lids, paper plates, all that sort of stuff. So what I'll do is I'll start to put in a few branches. Actually, I might call her an audience member. <laughs> OK, who wants to do um, Would anyone like to have a shot? Good, good. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Smile for the camera. Give him a wave. Hi. <laughs> right, let's put that one Thank on you. there. Thank you. I don't want to get... Let's to turn around. So I'm turning off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes when I do this, people don't volunteer, so it gets a bit awkward. <laughs> so I'm glad someone did. So what I might... We'll just turn this around so you can see from that angle. What I might get you to do is, how about we put two branches there? Do those two? So if you need a little bit of a guide, just somewhere around there. Okay. And there's no right or wrong. So, oh, very confident, lady. Good. Possibly, Possibly has, I would say. Twice. Good. That's good. Put a, maybe a couple of little sort of round dots. Like, see, I've done these little sort of like bud bits on the tree. You can put, you don't necessarily have to do it the way I've done. You can add another branch or two if you'd like. Now, because this lady's done so well, I might get her to do something a little bit bigger. So we might do this one. That should be. Up there? Yeah. Can you. Re <laughs> 
The other thing too, I was asked uh, sometimes, do I use an easel? Now, for every project in this book, I didn't use an easel and I deliberately didn't use it because I, it was for people who had never painted before and I didn't want people to think they had to spend a lot on a lot of different materials. So I wanted to keep it pretty basic. Are they, yeah, well, <laughs> I must remember that. Don't you see, you learn something new every day. And while this lady's doing a very nice job of these branches here, uh, the other thing too is when you take a, a proposal to a publisher, the first thing they are thinking above everything else is, can I make money from this? So you've got to bear in mind you've got to have a commercially viable thing that people are going to respond to. That's, that's possibly one of the most important things, I think, about publishing a book, that you've got to remember it. So for them, it's a business. For you, it's a more emotional investment because, you know, you want it to be and you're excited and you've put it out there. For them, it's a business. So you've got to come up with an idea that is, you know, a commercial idea. Well, good, good. Okay, where else would you like to um, uh, Actually, you're, normally people are really quite hesitant, so it <laughs> takes ages, but... This lady's quite good. No, that'll do. That's fine, because we've got a sort of stamp of fear. Okay, so as you can see, it's slowly taking shape. This lady has done the branches just in a basic way. Now, even though it's quite patchy in parts, I quite like that. And I think, uh, be careful not to be too uh, judgmental of your painting as you progress, because often the final result, these things work, as opposed to you might think, oh, you know, maybe that branch isn't right or this isn't right. But once you put all the sort of blossom type things on, it does change very strongly how the whole thing looks. Okay, so the second part of this project will be the blossoms. And that's just simply a large roundish potato. I looked for a particular roundish type one. And I'm just going to basically create the blossoms with a standard potato print dip. Now, in the book I've used magenta, but I could probably use another colour. Does anyone want another colour? Does anyone care? No, they're all loving pink. <laughs> What's that you say? More magenta. <laughs> Why, yes. <laughs> no, so, so, well, that's good. We'll just keep doing it that way. Oh, that was the paint. <laughs> just did go. I do have a cold, but that wasn't me. Um, and you just... Basically, spread it around a bit like that. And then you get the potato stamp. Okay. So, there is is a little bit of an act to this one. You just sort of press it down, move it around a little bit, and just have a look to see it's covered. And what I might do is get another audience member. Does anybody want to have another go? If you don't want to. This is an easy one. This is easy. This is easy. Okay, I might get you to do... I'll do, I'll do the first one so you can see. Basically, you just put it down and maybe twirl it just a tiny bit. Okay. And then you get that. And we'll do another. I'll get you to do that one. So you... Just place it down flat. Yep, good. And move it around. Just turn, just turn it at the fork. And then just lift it up. Perfect. See? <laughs> She's like a potato stamping pro, as she should be as a representative from the <laughs> So I would continue probably just doing a few sort of... I might, do you want to do the rest, the other pink ones? Yeah. Just be careful of doing it on the... Do the black type, the wet ones, well, where the black later. branches are later, because they'll tend to smudge. But the other ones should be pretty much fine. Just exactly as it is in the book. Yeah, just as a guide. Or you can put them anywhere you like. That's fine. Just leave room because there's got to be some white ones put in there later. So leave me some space. Add a bit more paint. Because <laughs> some people just... I've actually taught at the Art Gallery of New South Wales and some people get quite stamp happy. Yeah, just move it up a little bit so it doesn't... Otherwise it'll smudge the... Yeah. Yep, that's beautiful. Keep going. Now, when we were doing this book, I actually had to do a series of photos. And originally, I was going to do the photos for it, but they weren't quite up to standard because each sort of like project has a step-by-step -step photo structure of what it does. And so I'd have to say the hardest thing about writing this book for me was not biting my nails for six months 
because I had to have really clean fingernails <laughs> for the book because I'm one of those people that bites them down until they're basically red. And so they said, oh, you know, you'll have to do something about that. So, you know, grain my fingernails. And the other thing too is there's a hand models tip and I'm, I'm going to show this hand models tip to you. Okay, I want you all to put your hands down like this. Just down there, look at them. See, you can usually see they're quite veiny. And Now what you do, you put it up and count to five. One, two, three, four, five. Put it down. All the veins are gone. Then they take the photo. That's how it works. <laughs> inside, <laughs> inside a hand models tip. There you go. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. Do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, go, go. Yeah, you get a nice... If I'll show you a little tip too if you wanted to, say, cover some of them up because sometimes they end up a little uneven. So you could probably put that one up there. That looks pretty dry now. Yeah. You can, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily sit oh, right down. Going, it can, going off the canvas, Ooh. yes. You could get a bit crazy like that. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. Okay, well, that's looking pretty good. Oh, yeah, or wherever, you know, just yeah. put another one on. Now, when you start writing a book too, what they do is they'll... They stagger your payment, so you get your agreed amount, and they stagger that, and so you might get... Say it's like $9,000, it wasn't, but just say it was. They... Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate they stagger it. So what they do is, say your payment is $9,000, what they'll do is on, on your first draft, on your first few chapters, they give you a certain amount, and then on your next lots delivered, they give you a, another amount, and on delivery of the final text, they give you the rest. So they basically keep you working rather than give it all to you in one sum. Um, when you do your first book, often people will say... Um, oh, are you still working? You've written a book. And I'm like, no, I am still working very much. But, um, because generally speaking, your first book doesn't make that much. Like, as a general rule, um, you usually find your second book will be the one that will make, you know, if you get a second or third or a deal, that's where your money all comes in. So I, I've met people and I'll say, oh, what do you do? And they'll say, I'm an author. And then they'll tell me they've published a book. And I think, yeah, but... Are you like a waiter or something? <laughs> because you must be doing something else because this is Sydney and it's not cheap. So, you know, you've got to be doing something else. And I certainly do. And I think most, I think most creative people are, who are pursuing any of these sorts of things usually do lots of little things on the side. Although the myth is that they do it all the time. I think maybe in the 70s they did, but it was a lot cheaper then from what I can go. <laughs> Um, I put in two proposals which have not been received too well. Um, publishing itself is in an interesting time at the moment because of the electronic revolution. So even when I did this book, there was it got picked up in the US and they set, we had to have a special negotiation for the electronic rights of whether each project could be sold individually or it would have to be sold as a whole. So that's sort of changing the way the whole downloadable book thing is changing the way of publishing. I think it's an interesting time and it'll be interesting to see what happens to books and magazines. I personally think it's great. Um, a lot of people have got that thing where they really just like a book and they like the integrity of a book and all that sort of stuff. And that is beautiful, but to me, it's still a book. It's just a different format. You know, like it's, it's like CDs and MP3 players. It's still music. It's just a different way and a more convenient way and some ways cheaper way, which is probably not so great for the publishing industry, but a way of delivering it. Um, so if you are doing a book, you will have to negotiate on electronic rights as well. That's something. So generally you uh, will be given a contract and you'll have to get a solicitor to look over it. But sometimes you may... I don't know if you need a specialist solicitor because there are entertainment solicitors that may be worth pursuing, but that's something you'd have to sort of consider. Um, OK, so while they're sort of drying, we could probably do the next part of it, which is to add some white dots, some white blossoms onto that one. It's basically the same thing again, except with white. And also, when you do projects too and you take them to a publisher, because they say, well, what projects are you going to do? You say, well, I've got, you know, this, this and this. You actually, I had to paint them full size, take them in, 
And then they'd go, oh, can we see that in blue? Can we see that in green? You know, like this one, for instance, went through a few colour changes. There was a green one that originally started out as blue. If I can find it. There it is. That one, I don't know if that sort of shows up on camera very well, but initially that was blue and white, and I took it in and they went, no, we'd like to see different colours. So it went through a few colour variations. Um, and another one that I, I did that... I did it in retro sort of 70s colours, which I really liked, and they said... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> they said that they would like to see them on neutral colours. So that one was originally done in those colours and they said, oh, can we see the more neutral sort of like decor-friendly colours so then it was done in beige and brown. I personally still really like the bright colours but, you know, they, they know their market. Once again, it's about a compromise. So I'll just do some more white ones here. Sure. Yeah, ask me questions. Feel free to interrupt. Uh, it's in, oh, well, funny you should say that. It's, uh, there's a French one, which I've given to this lady here, which, it's, so it's been translated into French. See, that's, that's sort of the original, and that's, I'm suffering from a bit of cover envy there, because I think that one, I really quite, I mean, the graphic designer did a beautiful job, but I really love that cover. And so that's a complete French one, so that was exciting. It's been translated into it, there was an American version as well, and I went to the States for that, um, which I thought would be terribly glamorous, but wasn't at all. But nevertheless, um, it was still quite exciting to see it, but it wasn't quite so exciting to get swine flu while over there. <laughs> so, um, and also to end out in a hostel sharing it with a heap of illegal immigrants, which was what I was doing because I couldn't afford a very good place. Um, so... But basically, the rights on sold. So it's 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 um, in England, it's in the US, it's in Holland, it's apparently in Korean. See, my publisher isn't there anymore. The woman that I was working with, who did a very good job, thanks very much. Um, and I don't. And so I didn't get sent all of them because obviously someone moves. It's like when an employee goes, all the things that were supposed to follow through don't always follow through. It's just a, it's just the way it is. And, you know, quite silly of me. I didn't really pursue it as much as I probably should have. But at the time, I, you know, I just was on to other things. Other proposals that got knocked back, perhaps. <laughs> they yeah, they do completely yeah, translate it. No, I've got the American one here. That's the same, but the name had to be changed. Oh, I'll just show okay. people that one. Like the, they basically send them the artwork. And they basically changed the name because there was a range of books called The Weekend Artist and they're kind of sketching books. Uh, and as for sort of seeing it um, the first time, the first time I saw it, saw it, I was in Ariel Books and I just turned around and there it was. Like I knew it was coming out, but it sort of comes out within a week's period. They think, oh, next week. So I just turned around and there it was. And it was a real thrill for me, but it was probably more a thrill, I've got to be honest, seeing it on Amazon. That was... A huge buzz, because that's where I buy a lot of books. And, you know, people comment on it and leave you feedback like this. <laughs> so here's, three people have left feedback for me on the, U, the US site. Someone says, great launching pad for great ideas. Love this book, says another. And then another says, it's okay. <laughs> Which I thought was really funny. I, I was quite happy to get a semi-negative review. And it says, for very basic artists, it's an introductory and a good starting off point. I was looking for some more inspiring ideas. <laughs> but just in case I shouldn't put myself down, another person has said, this book is amazing for anyone who's a beginner with acrylic or just needs some new ideas for creating DIY projects. So it's that thing that, you know, some people are into it, some people aren't. Uh, the one thing that the... French, all the other versions that I've seen did that um, is leave my photo off. Like, see, there's a photo of me, which we had to take in the art store while all the staff were laughing at me and trying to make me look like an idiot, but I think I did a good enough job myself. Um, and they were basically, in every other version, my photo's been taken off it. And, so, 
And I began to get slightly paranoid too because I did a couple of interviews because the next stage of publishing a book is that you will go on the publicity trail. Uh, now, anyone who's publishing a book, basically the publicity department will have a period of time where they can, you know, devote to you. And because you knew, they, you know, it's not as much as, say, they're going to give the latest MasterChef cookbook, you know, because they know there's a lot of money behind that and it's got more of a market, whereas if I ring up and say it's me... You know, they're just like, well, who are you? Whereas if it's a MasterChef thing, there's a brand pushing it and all that sort of stuff. So you'll be given a limited amount of time uh, of attention. So my advice to anyone who's doing publishing a book is to work on your own promotional things as well because they'll organise some and you can organise some as well because they've got a more limited time to work on it than you do. So keep up your own publicity. And I got a few sort of gigs and I got interviewed by people. Um, I got interviewed by one newspaper and I was going to be in one of those, you know, his favourite things type columns. And then they came around and took all the photos and never published them. (laughs) And then I did another interview with the Sydney Morning Herald with a guy and they came around and took the photos and then stuck a photo of a brush in there instead. (laughs) So I began to get get quite paranoid there for a little while. I mean, you know, I'm no oil painting or an acrylic painting, it would appear. But it it was just quite... Is anyone using my photo? And then, of course, you know, you give it to the French and then they knock you back. And I'm half French, so you'd think they'd know. But <laughs> so we'll just continue on on these blossoms here. It's slowly starting to develop a bit more. Now, the other thing, too, is if anyone's got any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind. If you want to know something or. You know, I'm not covering something you want. You can either chat to me now or afterwards, I don't mind. Or just go, if you've got any questions afterwards or anything you want to know, just um, contact, uh, just go to the Matisse website and there's a, a contact email there and just market attention to myself and it'll get passed on to me because in full disclosure, I do work here every once every couple of weeks doing some writing, which is nice. Okay. Let's get someone to just... Okay. So do you think we should uh, hold it up? Do you think we should stop or go? Do we need more? Do we think more? You like that? I think maybe one more. Or do you think I'll wreck it? <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Um, stop it. It's true. A bud. How could I do a bud? I could do it with a smaller potato, perhaps. I'm just thinking. You could probably do a range of sizes in that way, like one of those small chat potatoes or whatever they are. (laughs) Believe me, there was a lot of experimenting with fruit and vegetables to get this. So, well, anyway, we'll just stop there for the moment. We'll just pop it up here while we're talking. Um, So so when it's published... um, uh, you asked how many I've sold. To be honest, I can't really tell you. It's been, um, it's been a moderate success in Australia, to be honest, but it's been quite successful in the UK. And the US has been quite good too. So that was something a bit unexpected because normally things water down a bit when they go to the UK. But because I was quite fortunate that it seemed to be quite good. And I think because they have, like the UK, I think, and America have a history of appreciation for patterns. Like, there's the whole Mexican influence in the UK and the whole, you know, making corn dolls and being on the colonial trail in the US. And, and then the UK has all those old tapestries and all those sort of things. I don't think Australians are so much into patterns as other countries are. And I think the whole crafty, arty thing sort of stems from that. Like, it's here in Australia, but not to the extent... Of, like, if you go to the US, there's amazing craft stores. Which brings me to my goes to the US. So I decided I'd go to the US for the part for basically the book. And because, you know, it's like, well, how many times will this happen in my life? And the way things are going, probably once. But, um, so we decided to go to the US and I just thought, well, I'll go to Disney World while I'm there. So I went over to Orlando because I get off the plane, go to Orlando, you know, go and check into my hotel. Not feeling so good, but just thinking it's that. And then I progressively get sicker and sicker and sicker. <laughs> so I ended up going to Disney World after going to, you know, what's it, Dwayne, Dwayne Reed chemists that are all over the US. And it's because there's a drugstore there. So I went and sort of dosed myself up with various legal prescriptions. 
And Disneyland's quite a different experience when you're absolutely dosed to the eyeballs, <laughs> flying around on roller coasters and everything. But I actually got really quite ill, and I nearly came home. But I ended up going back to San Francisco, uh, where I saw it. Uh, I went to one bookstore and did like a little bit of a demo and a little bit of a signing. There wasn't many people there, but it was kind of more a, a symbolic thing for me. And then I saw it in another bookstore, which was another really major bookstore, and asked the lady, would she let me take a photo? She said, oh, I said, well, you know, will you take a photo of me with this book in this bookstore? And she was like, well, we'll have to speak to security and management first. And I'm going, but look, it is me. This is my life. You know, I haven't come all this way to, you know, terrorise you with a bomb, you know, in a camera to take a photo of a book. Um, so it was kind of funny that she just thought it was a really weird request and I felt quite awkward about it. But all's well, it ends well, you know, it... it went off quite well and it was a huge thrill to see it in bookstores in the US. Like, it's, it's pretty amazing to see that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing too is often people ask you how much money you made off it and you don't really make a lot of money but there's the other things that come off doing these sort of things. Like I had one woman do a whole blog which was a, one of my projects every single week and that's a, that's a really nice thing, you know, like, and I've given, you know, talks like this and I've done other craft talks in various places and, you know, people send you work that they've done, which I really appreciate, and they come into the shop and, you know, I've uh, done stuff at the craft fair and people were really nice, would come and actually want their photo taken with you, which is really quite, uh, you know, quite... A, it's an unusual thing, you know, to sort of have people... You think, why would they want that from me? <laughs> like, that's what I would think, but, like... Yeah, you know, like, they'd come in and they'd say, oh, will you stand there? And you'd be like... It was really lovely, actually, but it's just surprising because you don't sort of expect that sort of... Well, I don't expect that sort of attention. Uh, the other thing, too, is when you do an interview for a newspaper, they will often... You get paraphrased. This has given me a slightly different view on the media because you answer all the questions and then you'll go and read it when it's published and it's kind of a paraphrased version of what you've said. It's quite interesting because you just think, well, if that's just happening with me, it must be happening with other people... And you sort of think, well, maybe that's how it works, you know, because you think, why did they say that? As if Julie Gillard would do that. And, you know, like you might be thinking, why are they doing these things or saying these things? And I, I do wonder how much, you know, like, I mean, the media's got a right to, they, got to, they can't do it verbatim. But you sort of think, oh, I just wonder, you know, how things, what was said and what ends up is, you know, how that actually happened. Well, we'll do our next project, which is basically using a Matisse product, which I have here, called Gel Medium. Now, this is a really easy project, but I've had a mixed response to it because I've had it in my house and people have come in and said, it's quite negative and it sucks you in, but I don't think it is. I think it's just the black. I think black's a slightly controversial colour for a lot of people. A lot of people find it a bit heavy. I quite like it. I think it's quite elegant. And once again, this is a really easy project. You could knock it over in a day easily. What, that's it there, which I don't know whether the camera will pick it up very well. And basically all it is, is I've done two coats of Derev and Matisse Black, which is once again a student quality painting, a student quality paint. And we're just going to make something quite hard edge and geometric. This one's quite sort of, it's a bit more softer and a bit flower and a bit girlier. And this one here will do a bit more sort of hard geometric. Okay, so this is gel medium. Now normally... Basically, it dries to like a clear, glossy finish. Now, I'm not going to use it in the way that it's been suggested for, and that's across the board with a lot of products. There's more than one way to use them. So, basically, you just get a jar of this. Just scoop it into a container, my old yogurt container there. And then just using Matisse Derivan Black paint, which was once again a student-grade one, just add a little bit of it to that. What I'm going to do is just sort of just sort of blend it in. And what it'll do, you might sort of think, well, you know, why are you doing that? You may as well just put it straight on. But what it does is it makes it really thick, so it gives it kind of like a really strong body, which I'm going to use when I put the fork through it. And it gives like a really strong texture to it. And then when it dries, it dries to a really, really high gloss finish. So it looks like an almost resin type finish. Uh, now the other thing too that I'll be doing for this is I don't want to put it on the whole canvas. So often when people do canvases, they'll decide the whole canvas has to be covered. And particularly when you start out, I think you think that you have to have absolutely every single square inch of the canvas covered. But you actually don't. So 
I usually just put it on maybe at an angle. And this is just like, this is like green masking tape, but it's just regular paper masking tape. You can just buy it at the supermarket, you know. Just don't put it on too heavily so you rip paint off when you're doing it. And what I'll do is with this mixture is just, just place it down and spread it out. It's sort of like a bit of a cake. Now, we've got a lady in the audience who's actually working with uh, disabled adults and she's sort of looking for some projects that might be suitable for them. So I'm going to ask her about this sort of thing. Is this something that people could do? Like, is this basic enough? Like... Well, because um, I've had quite a few people um, contact me and have used the book with people with um, physical and mental disabilities, which is a real compliment to me because I think that, you know, all people should have a go and should be able to do something creative. And that's another sort of theory I had on the book is that, that art is for sort of everyone. I think it has, like, people like Jamie Oliver I think are really amazing because what they've done is they've made people realise that good cooking isn't necessarily restaurant cooking. And I think there's degrees of being an artist. Like, people often say, oh, I'm not really an artist. And, but you don't actually have to leave work to live in a garret to become an artist. And, you know, you, I think you can actually achieve something, you know, within your, your abilities and what you want to do with, a, you know, with a, the right project and things like this. Uh, I, I think people shouldn't get too caught up in everything being absolutely awesome. It's like, you know, there's degrees of doing things. And, and I just think it's... That's why I wrote the book, and people would, people would often be quite apologetic when they brought things in to show me that they'd done, and I always thought it was a bit strange, and I always thought that they shouldn't feel that way. So it's, as you can see, it's like a quite sort of thick, shiny finish. Now, I thought we'd probably add some texture, so we'll just <sighs> pull that out of the potato. And it's quite simply just creating, like, a line-type texture. It's like sort of a semi-architectural type look. And it's just running a regular old fork, like I just, you know, would watch out at Salvation Army or St Vincent de Paul and buy a lot of these old sort of forks. Although I must admit a couple of times I have noticed people that I live with eating with them after they've been through the dishwasher, but I just don't say anything. <laughs> and see, as the, see, now if I just put on regular paint, it wouldn't hold the line as strongly as it does. And you just take that over. I'll give that a quick wipe. And another thing that happens is when you get a book is you get recognised every now and then. You get... I was actually in the chemist warehouse about two weeks ago and someone came up and said, are you the weekend artist? And I was like, why, I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then they... And then they ask you questions, so, which is fine too. I don't mind that either. But it's um, and when when the book first came out, I was uh, walking down the street in uh, near Pitt Street, and you know how you see someone looking at you if you walk along in the city, and you see someone looking at you, and you think if you ask me for money, I will, <laughs> you know, like you see them looking at you, and you go, they're going to ask me for money, and you sort of think, do I cross the road? But you know, you, you sort of get ready to either stare them out or just keep walking. Anyway, this this girl was looking at me and I was like, oh, here she goes, she's going to ask. And as she walked past, she went, I love your book and kept walking, <laughs> which made me feel terribly. I thought, yes, I am a Sydney, cynical Sydney cider after all. So, see, what I'm doing here is just creating this, like, cross sort of effect, sort of just like... So some of the initial crosses will come through and some won't. And because it's not applied evenly, you'll get this graduation of the texture. Now, you don't necessarily have to do it that way. Other people that I've done it, done this with, have had a different approach. And I'm going to sort of mess this all up and call on an audience member. Would anyone like to have a go? To come up with something. <laughs> you, can, you shouldn't do this too often, incidentally, because it starts to dry, but we'll, we'll have a go. 
messed it all up. Oh, just for me. Just for you, so now you get to do it. But what you could, just in case you were you no, sort of not sleeping. thinking, <laughs> I'm sure you weren't. I've been watching for the yawners. Um, that's all right. You could do something like that. Do you see what I mean? Like it doesn't necessarily have to. It could be something more random or, you know, you could go, oh, that's probably not going to work too well. But, you know, sort of, and then maybe go a different way. You don't necessarily have to do it the way I've done it. But I'll let you have a go. So has anybody got any questions on publishing a book or the projects? Is there anything you want to... Mark, did you have anything you wanted to ask? I can... Uh, we can chat afterwards if you'd like to. Yeah, that's fine. How, how long did it take from... From where to go, like doing projects and everything was about two... It was about two years where to go. It was a lot of work. Like... Um, when you, went, you made the initial pitch? Or yeah, uh, initial, uh, from I did the initial project, it was about two years. The actual process to write the book, I think I had about six months, six or seven months to write it and, you know, obviously submitting it at various stages and then we had the photographer who was... Like, it was really quite hard because you had to do everything in um, stages. So I could... When they photographed the project, you had to have one at each stage. So you had to have five and then they put it down to take the photo, do the next one, take the photo, do the next one, take the photo, because I can't wait for you to do this. So there was a lot of work involved in life. And my garage is just full of half-done canvases, which I said I would change at some other stage. See, now there's a different sort of... <coughs> excuse me. A different sort of look. So, okay, we'll let the ladies in the audience decide. Do we keep it like this or we change it back to mine? We have Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we'll leave that. Okay. No, no, we'll do it. No, that's cool. So, when you yeah. Uh, no, I was working, so I used to go home and write it at night because I'm slightly cursed, and in the morning too, because I'm slightly cursed because I'm one of those rare people that wakes up at 5.30 in the morning ready to go. Oh, wow. And no one in Sydney <laughs> is, and nothing in Sydney is open. So I would get up and write quite early in the morning. But because, once again, when, going back to the proposal, because it's so mapped out for you, and you've already written half of it more or less anyway, the projects would think, because I was coming up with other projects, and they said, you know, can you stop coming up with projects <laughs> because we've got to write the book. So I was getting a bit carried away with the project. Now, if you decide to do this one, you've got to take the tape off while it's still wet because if you wait till it dries, it dries to a solid, like, mass and the whole thing comes off in one go. So you end up with, like, a fairly strong... Have we got a bin? Got a bin? Oh, thanks. Um, so you end up with something that's kind of... I quite like it because it's quite sort of minimal. Now, if you... The other thing, too, is with some of these, you could say... If you did, say, two of these together, you know, if you did multiples... Often multiples of things look really good. Like, I've seen this one done in a house in three different colours. So it was done in purple, green and pink. And if you put them all next to each other, it can be quite striking to sort of see what they actually look like. Like, multiples often make something look better. So this one I actually did in my own house, and I really like it, and I had it on the wall. It's much bigger than this... But for the sake of, you know, the camera and everything, I've done this a little bit smaller. And it was huge. It was about nearly my height and about that wide. And not everyone kept coming in and saying how much they hated it. <laughs> so I eventually took it down because I was like, oh, guys, but it looks kind of nice. I See, I think it's quite stylish, actually, in a really minimal way. And once again, you know, you could knock that up in a day easily. That's something really good. So if you've just moved into a house or you're, you know, looking for something for a wall or if... A, if you're working with people, you've got a limited amount of time. You could probably, for something like this, I'm just thinking, you could use a smaller scale and maybe some different colours and you could join them up. Like, you know, if it had three small ones, like you could have, say, two black and one white or, you know, a car, another colour that you like. I'd probably avoid using primaries. That's another thing too. It's hard, except red maybe, but it's hard to make primaries not look like you've just painted it with primaries and they can look a little bit school children-like. So if you just use yellows, reds, Blues, but if you sort of use slightly odd colours, that sort of works a bit better. So, as so yes, yeah, so basically the book still sells now, and I still get the odd royalty check. It's been three years, so it's over its peak. But I still get things like this coming up, and I still get people contacting me about it and projects and on Facebook and saying, "Are you the guy that wrote that book?" And I'm like, "Yes, I am." So I let them be friends and hope that they're not nuts. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> which so far, touch wood, they haven't proved to be. Um, but the one thing I would say is if you're thinking of doing something like this or whatever, you, you know, something creative and you're trying to pursue it, is these things are normally made up of a lot of little things put together. Like, so if you get the chance to do things, like if someone says, oh, do you want to try this, do you want to do that, I really think it's important just to go, yeah, I'll do it. And, you know, if it's within reason. Um, I think a lot of people also have that, well, are you paying me for it? Like, a lot of people have that, will I get paid for this? All the time. Even if they haven't even got on the bottom rung of the ladder, you say, oh, would you give me a hand with this? Will, will you pay me? It's like, but I'm not even getting paid. You know, so there's... I, I just think small things... For me, I would say, don't knock things back because things come from other things. Like, little things all add up. And, um, and also, like, I just think, too, that... You know, what else are you going to do? If you're not doing that thing, you're just going to be pottering around the house or maybe, you know, you're probably just going to be watching TV, so why not give it a shot? So that's my general philosophy, that lots of little things add up to something quite interesting. So, well, that probably pretty much concludes today's session. Um, but if anyone's got any questions, I'm quite happy to talk to people afterwards too, if you've got any questions, either of you ladies. And, yes. Well, thank you very much for attending. And those people at home, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.